Hey, you guys, welcome to this week's edition of the Pantry Chat Food for Thought. Today, I have a special guest, and we're going to be talking about growing mushrooms at home. This is something Josh and I have wanted to get into for years, and we've done a little bit of it. We've done some garden mushrooms, but we have not gotten any further than that. So we're really excited about learning more about it. So today we have Chris Gilmore with us and we're gonna be talking all about growing mushrooms at home. So here we go, Chris, welcome. Hey, so nice to be here, this is fun. I love this yeah. topic. Yeah, this is a great one. I think it's something that people are looking at more and more as the word has gotten out that growing mushrooms is maybe not as hard as we all thought it might have been. Yeah, and it, it really, I mean, to me as a, you know, kind of a small scale modern homesteader, it just makes sense for so many reasons. Like it really has been a game changer on our little homestead. So so we've been growing wine caps for the last oh, few nice. years, and we've just been doing it in our garden beds, like right in the rows, because we already use a lot of compost, and then we mulch our walkways with uh, wood chips. And so they're just super happy and they grow all over the place. At this point, I've got more wine caps than I could ever actually consume. Um, and so I got really interested in the idea of some of these garden mushrooms that we could just do in the garden rows. And I tried, um, what do they call them? Almond portabellas, which are the oh, agaricus cool. this yeah. last year. And I never got them to actually do anything. So I'm like, ah, oh, maybe I'll try it again. We'll see. But I'm really excited about moving even outside of just those garden mushrooms that you can grow in your garden rows and uh, getting into some more. So I'm, I'm excited about today's topic. It's gonna be a lot of fun. Um, but first, why don't you tell us a little bit about your story and how you got started in like, how did you get here where you're growing mushrooms and teaching people about growing mushrooms? Sure, yeah. Um, so my wife and I, we've been together uh, a little over uh, 20 years now, my wife, Laura. And uh, when we were in our early 20s, uh, we basically went on a farm tour. Uh, so went and worked on various organic farms kind of all over, really all over North America, Canada and the United States. And uh, I landed on a farm on the West Coast called uh, Seven Raven Farms out on Salt Spring Island. We're up in Canada. Um, and I did uh, basically kind of like an apprenticeship there for a whole season or like a garden internship. Uh, and that was my first exposure to both foraging and growing mushrooms. So we had a market garden there, uh, but we also had an eco forestry operation. Um, so we would, you know, it was a very small, like 40 acre property. And uh, this guy made a significant amount of money from 40 acres of woods, which is actually almost unheard of in the forestry world. So that was actually what kind of called me to that place. But one neat layer element of that was is after we went in the selectively cut trees he had a guy that would come in and inoculate the stumps right in the forest with uh, mushroom mycelium um, and they were growing edible and medicinal mushrooms right in the forest and then we were also growing them in the garden and he had this amazing valley that was full of oyster mushrooms uh, and we had a market garden there but we would actually go and forage oyster mushrooms for our csa boxes so that was kind of my first foray into both growing and foraging mushrooms uh, and then, you know, kind of jump ahead a decade, my wife and I, with Laura, we bought our little homestead uh, up here in Canada. Um, and one of the first things that we got into doing was doing mushroom logs. So doing shiitake mushroom logs um, and uh, really quickly realized like, wow, like out of everything that we grow on the homestead, this feels like one of the best exchanges of energy. Like as far as like <laughs> calories put in and calories that we get back, uh, we were really, really impressed. Um, so we, we, you know, I just got super nerdy about it, you know, and um, started doing all kinds of experiments, started playing around with growing species indoors, outdoors, different techniques. Um, and then my wife, you know, I do a fair bit of foraging as well, but my wife really went down the uh, the foraging rabbit hole. Uh, so she's become incredibly knowledgeable as a forager, and leads, you know, foraging walks now, mushroom walks. Um, and then I've kind of gone more down, now we both kind of know both elements, but as I said, Laura's really kind of gone down the, the foraging route for mushrooms. And she's actually a professional forager and runs a foraging business. Um, so it makes sense she'd go that way. And then I kind of went down the uh, the growing route, um, which is, uh, yeah, yeah, kind of what I teach now. And we do workshops through Wild Muskoka. That's our, our foraging business there on, on both growing and foraging mushrooms today. So That is amazing. You know, something that I just learned in this last year, at least here for us in Idaho in the United States, that there are actually certifications for mushroom foragers here. I don't know if that's true in Canada. But um, but a local restaurant was featuring these wild mushrooms and they were, um, you know, 
brought in the mushroom forager actually and she was talking about all the certification levels she had to go through in order to be able to safely like okay. sell these to restaurants after she had forged them for herself and so it's really fascinating how deep you can go into that world but it is a product that is like people want that restaurants want that now it's it's a very desirable product even on kind of the professional side so that's a very fascinating that she's yeah, doing yeah absolutely if people are thinking cash crops you know mushrooms are actually again you know a pretty uh, potentially a uh, a lucrative crop to grow you know and th and that's something that i think a lot of homesteaders are always looking for is like how do i make my land profitable so that i can spend more time on the land and not have to spend so much time going out to work so i think that's a, a really good element to bring in now something that you're really passionate about is building healthy communities um and just curious as we're chatting a little bit before we dive totally into the main subject, like how do mushrooms play into that? Because my guess is, is that they actually do most things on the homestead can, right? Um, how do mushrooms play into healthy communities? Are you talking yeah. about ecological communities or human communities or all, all above when you, when you phrase that question? Yeah. Well, on your website, you talk about having a passion for healthy community building. Oh, and yeah. so, yeah, so I'm, you know, curious how the mushroom foraging plays into that. Yeah, awesome. Um, you know, I, I look at community kind of in a broad way because there is there's the ecological communities. And, you know, the more I learn about my mycelium, the more fascinated I play with their ecological role, you know, just in the Earth's ecology. Um, you know, um, they're uh, one of the main organisms that actually like breaks down matter. So things like when a tree dies in the forest and it's hard, you know, mycelium plays an essential role in recycling that into soil and making the uh, basically the nutrients and all the other foods available to all the other organisms, you know, whether it's bacteria, whether it's insects, uh, and then the mycelium itself becomes super important food for the organisms too, you know, uh, insects, bugs, uh, even mammals and squirrels and birds are all coming and eating that. So mycelium is foundational to the community, if you think about the web of life. Um, and then beyond that, it, it's become a really amazing uh, opportunity to bridge with our community and think about local kind of food security and self-reliance because you can grow such a, a small amount in a, uh, or sorry, large amount in a very small space. Uh, it's, it's a very efficient one, you know, from a local food security perspective. Uh, and then of course, you know, that creates the opportunity to kind of rally around it. So where we live, you know, I start, we sort of the kind of, there weren't many people doing it in our region when we first started going. Uh, and of course, people will get out, you're doing mushrooms, what's this all about? So one of our favorite ways to grow is shiitakes on logs. There is a bit of upfront work, you know, because we're actually going to go out, we're going to harvest uh, green trees from the forest, we're going to cut them to length, uh, we're going to set up all the equipment, we're going to drill them, we'll maybe get into that later. But one of the first activities that happened when we started first, people were asking us about what's this all about? And two, it's like, wow, this is a lot of labor as two people if we're going to do it any kind of quantity. So we actually started throwing these community parties um, where people would come along and basically learn and be like, hey, you show up for the day, you help us get this done, you go home with a log at the end of the day. Um, and so we're actually building community while spreading the skill set uh, that increases kind of local food resilience and local food security. Yeah, that is so important. Um, and I love the way you tie the ecological community into the human community, too, because, uh, you know, for us, for Josh and I here on the homestead, we talk a lot about systems and how the systems interconnect with each other. And that's kind of that same concept that, you know, your garden should be feeding into other parts of your homestead, your barn and your, your animal system should be feeding into other parts of the homestead. And in the same way, our household should be feeding into the community at large and vice versa. Yeah, and so, yeah, it's just a, such a beautiful picture so many homesteaders feel isolated. And this is not just post COVID. They just are maybe they feel like they're the only people who are doing what they're doing, right? And so it's an amazing way to bring um, people together. I know when we first got to North Idaho, we um, being from a very dry region of California, we were not at all clued in to mushroom foraging. And up, up here, uh, you know, the morel mushroom hunting is like a, a sacred ritual almost in the spring. Like it becomes a really big deal up here. And so I remember the first time we were here in the spring and we we went by, Josh and I drove by the street corner where the um, whole field had been burned the year before. 
And there were all these people and they were slowly walking around looking at their feet. And we were like, we were so clueless. We were really naive, you know, and we're like, oh my gosh, like what happened here? Was this a, is this a religious ceremony? Like, we don't know. These people look like they're walking around meditating or something. Come to find out they're all kicking around looking for morel mushrooms, you know? And, um, but there was a whole field of them. Like there were people everywhere was stopping and people were greeting each other and they were saying hi. And so you know, as you get out there and you get to these spots where like there's community foraging going on, it really does build this community aspect. If you get to know other people who are doing what you're doing and then you end up with mushrooming buddies and, you know, foraging buddies and it, it really creates a whole nother community life outside of just your own homestead. So I just really wanted to bring that out and bring that to the front about what you're doing is that, you know, sometimes these things don't have to be solitary and all alone like it feels like. Yeah. And I, I just spoke to, you know, the growing aspect. I mean, people love the mushroom work party in the spring, yeah. you know, coming and doing the logs, uh, but foraging, you know, we've met so many cool people out foraging, you know, cause you, you, what you find is there's, there's spots and habitats that are associated with different species, you know? Um, so, and, and the mushroom foragers, you know, that's a small, even though it's growing quickly, it's still relatively a small kind of niche world. So once you start to establish where the good habitat and spots are, inevitably you're going to bump into other foragers and you've got something in common and now you're making new friends and, um, so we, we've met lots of interesting folks when we're out foraging or people that just come up and say, hey, what are you doing? Uh, right. And then strike up a cool conversation. So there, there's definitely a community building component around the foraging. Um, and, and can I just touch on one more piece on uh, on systems before you go in? Uh, yeah. That popped into my mind there. Uh, so as far as thinking about cyclical loops on the homestead and kind of closing them things, you know, mushrooms have been phenomenal for that as well. So when we grow our mushrooms indoors in the wintertime, you know, one of my favorites, you're not producing a lot this way, but it's super fun. It's a great project with kids uh, is we'll grow in spent coffee grounds, um, okay. like literally just in mason jars, you know, in the kitchen, we'll grow oyster mushrooms there. I also grow it straw in bags, but the, so the first round, you know, we take a, a, a product that's a waste product from our coffee, the grounds, and, you know, we could put that right into the compost. But now we put it into a mason jar and we inoculate it with mycelium. Then we get, you know, two or three flushes of mushrooms off that. That coffee ground is now supercharged with this super potent, rich mycelium. Um, so that coffee has actually become a better nutrient than it was before. So we could just put that into the compost. But our next step is we actually go to our vermicomposter. So our worm <laughs> composter. And we feed the mushroom mycelium coffee grounds to the worms. The worms absolutely love it. And, you know, um, you think about like the superfood, like kind of buzzwords that are going around. Like, I swear, like, I think coffee ground mycelium is a superfood. You know, you could sell it for a ton of money for the worms if they had if they had money to buy it with, you know. So now <laughs> we're feeding that to the worms who now consume it, which that actually causes them to create even better fertilizer. And now we use that to water our starts in the springtime, right? Our Burma, that's our, kind of our main fertilizer when we're getting vegetables going, is the castings from the worms which I actually think is supercharged because they're eating the mycelium from the spent mushrooms. So there's just kind of a cool example of how you can kind of tie these things in and make them cyclical uh, in your system as well, right? Oh yeah, I absolutely love that. That's something Josh would get super excited about. So he would he would be out there right now getting his worms and his mushrooms going if he heard that. So, <laughs> so yeah, that might be in our future because that is really neat and it's a great way to, like you said, just keep reusing the same thing, but making it better and better, which is really what our goal is with working with our land, right? As we're working on our land, we wanna be improving it the whole way along, leaving it more fertile and better shape, better condition as when we leave it. And that's just a great way to do that turning something that people are dumping in the trash don't throw your coffee grounds in the trash <laughs> don't do yeah. it they're too bad yeah when we grow on straw you, you know you can literally take that straw and go use it for mulch afterwards too right yeah um and you know it's in most conditions you know the mushrooms probably aren't going to start growing again uh when you go and mulch a bed with it you know in some conditions they actually could uh, a lot of conditions they don't, but, you know, if you're going to be laying down straw anyways, you know, as a garden mulch, either to as a weed barrier or to build soil, if you've inoculated with mycelium, you've got a few flushes of food and then you go mulch with it. Uh, one, you're just doing more uh, with less. And then two, I, I, I really believe you're adding more nutrients to that soil by putting that that straw down that's laid with mm. the, the mycelium in the first place. Right. That is amazing. Yeah, that is really neat. Good. Well, speaking of supercharging things, all you have to do is go to, you know, Pinterest or Instagram and scroll a little bit and you're bound to find some new mushroom coffee or something like that that is kind of all the rage at the moment because people are realizing how good mushrooms really are for your health or they're kind of coming back to the forefront. I think we've always known that they can be really good. But um 
you know, the downside of them is when you go and buy them in those nice little packages, they are so expensive. Even going to your grocery store and getting good quality or your farmer's market, getting good quality mushrooms that have been grown by somebody else or foraged by somebody else is just incredibly expensive. Um, but the good news is, is you can actually grow a lot at home and that's so exciting. So take us through some of the different mushrooms that you can grow at home and what their main benefits are. Sure. Um, you know, when people are starting out, so maybe even, a, even if I was to back up one step, as far as growing techniques, you know, you're, you're either going to grow indoors or you're going to grow outdoors. Okay. Right. And then there's a few different techniques that you might use with each one. And then the different techniques are kind of connected to different species. All right. Um, so maybe I'll start with outdoor growing, um, sure. for, for all the gardeners in the, the crowd tonight. Um, so outdoors, you know, there's, there's a ton of mushrooms you could grow, but not all mushrooms are, um, equal as far as their ease of growing. Um, so probably two of the easiest ones to start with, uh, if you're going to grow in beds, wine caps are, um, King Strafaria mushrooms. And, and the reason they're often easier is because they just have a very, probably it's the, the perfect word, but like an aggressive mycelium, meaning they'll like out compete other native myceliums that are in the habitat. Um, and they're less prone to like things like bacteria and molds and stuff getting in there because they're just, uh, such an aggressive mycelium. Mm -hmm. Some of the slower growing myceliums um are, are really amazing you know have all kinds of medicinal benefits but if you don't have every little piece perfectly tweaked they can actually be a lot more a lot more challenging to grow so probably the first thing i'd share with folks you know if you're just getting started uh oyster mushrooms uh wine cap mushrooms and shiitake mushrooms on logs are probably three of the best starting points um that i often recommend um because both the oysters and the wine cap are very fast growing mycelium very aggressive uh, I always say, you know, you can do a few things wrong when you're growing wine caps and oysters and still have success. You can do a lot of, like, for example, something like um, mataki mushrooms, you know, um, or, or even lion's mane for that matter. You know, you can do a lot of things right and still have it go wrong when you're growing some of those other species. Oysters and wine caps, you can do a bunch of stuff wrong and still have it go right and, and get a good flush off. Um, so those are really good starting species. Uh, shiitakes, um, are maybe a little bit harder if you're going to be growing them indoors, but outdoors on logs, they're actually a great species to start with as well. Um, okay. Yeah. So if you're inoculating into, into fresh wood, uh, we have shiitake logs that have been fruiting for literally nine years. So we inoculated oh, wow. them once. Uh, so it is, you know, it is a bit of initial work up front to actually harvest the logs, cut them, you know, you know, it'll take us, we'll spend about two days a year inoculating mushrooms. But the difference is, you know, I spend way more than two days on my tomatoes every year uh, <laughs> and I get one harvest at the end of the year. And then I have a ton of work after I harvest them still. I spend two days a year on my shiitakes and they produce for nine more years afterwards. Wow. You know? And I, I'd say six to nine years, depending on the growing conditions of the species that you're growing on there. Um, that That's amazing. That I did not know that they went that long. Talk, before you move on really quickly, cover what each of those mushrooms are good for. For the, some of us who are just kind of like mushrooms or mushrooms um you know are they medicinal are they edible for each of those three varieties you just mentioned yeah um i think of uh, i mean all three of them are edibles and basically all the mushrooms we're going to be talking about are edibles um and they all have here's the thing with mushroom medicine it's quite complex when you get into it uh there's a really good book it's actually called if you know if somebody wants just like a clear diagram of like this mushroom has these properties there's a book called fungal pharmacy uh, and in the back of it, it actually has tables and it's literally like, you know, like diabetes and anti-tumor and anti-inflammatory. And um, and the more, um, you know, I'll preface this by saying uh, I don't always talk a lot about. So I've spent a ton of time learning and reading about, you know, kind of the medicinal value of mushrooms. I'm always cautious sharing. Uh, I'm going to steal a line from a guy, Tim Ferriss. He's kind of a famous guy on the Internet. But he always says, I'm, I'm, I'm not a doctor and I don't pretend to be one on the Internet. <laughs> so I'm going to say that right now. So I'm, all, I'm always cautious to just throw out these broad words when it comes to medicinal mushrooms, because um, I, I tend to believe that health is maybe a little bit more complex to just like this mushroom does this thing. Um, and, you know, that's a whole other conversation or a whole other podcast there. Uh, but in general, I'd say, you know, a lot of the species that we're talking about are, you know, they're all higher in antioxidants. Uh, most of them have some degree of anti-inflammatory properties. Uh, there's tons of research and how they can be supportive with um, as like adaptogens um, mm -hmm. and just helping your body regulate, um, you know, various different things. Um, you know, there's tons of research coming out there on the value of mushrooms, even in, in cancer, uh, whether it's as a preventative um, through probably roles and mechanisms such as its antioxidant properties, such as its anti-inflammatory properties. Uh, but even really fascinating research coming out how mushrooms can even be supportive to somebody going through traditional 
uh, chemo treatments for cancer and stuff, you know? Um, so you're going through the modern treatment system and your mushrooms, because of their adaptogenic properties, are actually helping you buffer, say, the radiation you're getting from your chemo. Um, so, you know, as, as general properties, I'd say they, they hold all kinds of wonderful things like that. Um, you know, shiitakes and oysters are probably a little bit more on the edible side. You know, we don't usually think of, I, I mean, they have all kinds of benefits, but they're not usually the ones that come to mind. When, when we start talking medicinals, we often think about like lion's mane for your brain or, you know, things like reishi. You know, reishi is probably one of the most well-researched medicinal uh, mushrooms out there. Like literally it's been used in Asia for like thousands of years um, and documented for thousands of years, you know, so incredible bodies of literature on the, the medicinal values of things like reishi, uh, you know, new ones like chaga and turkey tail coming up, or I shouldn't say new mushrooms, but there's a lot more research. Those are ones that are kind of becoming new as far as being trendy mushrooms. Um, so those are kind of some of the mushrooms I start thinking about when we go more into the medicinal realm of mushrooms. Um, so shiitake oysters uh, definitely have medicinal value, but um, we, we often put them a little bit more in the edible category than the, than the medicinal category, if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, one of the things that I have found is really fascinating. I don't know if this is true of all mushrooms, but I think that the research is coming out with the wine caps is their ability to actually absorb vitamin D yeah. and then to hold on to it so that if you consume them then later in the winter when you're not getting as much sunshine that you're actually essentially taking like a vitamin D supplement by consuming them or something similar. Um, you know, so there's a lot of really interesting properties that uh, mushrooms may hold answers for as we're trying to do more things ourselves and be a little more self-sufficient. Absolutely. You know, and, and um, so shiitakes absolutely as well. So we'll actually, when we harvest our shiitakes fresh, we'll actually set them in the sun for a little while before we actually process them. Uh, and they will literally absorb extra vitamin D out of the sun there, or, or at least synthesize and create extra vitamin D um, just by leaving them in the sun for longer upon harvesting. Um, and, you know, an interesting just story on that to actually speak to how potent that is. A, a few years ago, this is probably about three years ago, um, I got some blood work done. And it was in the winter time, and I had almost toxic levels of vitamin D in my system. Oh, wow. Yeah, and most people in North America are actually have a shortage of vitamin D. And what I realized, I so up until that point, I would usually take a vitamin D supplement in the winter, and then I'd go off it in the summer. Um, and I'd never really got my blood check before while I was doing it. So sure enough, this one year I went to go get my blood check. I was just taking a regular vitamin D supplement, exactly what it said on the label. And I had almost borderline toxic levels of vitamin D. Uh, and in chatting with the, the doctor, we basically realized that because I was consuming so many mushrooms already, I had no need for that vitamin D supplement. I was naturally getting way more, or not way more than I need, but I had enough. Yeah. So I actually stopped eating mushrooms for three months and stopped the vitamin D. Like I had to go off of everything because vitamin D actually takes a while to actually get out of your flush out of your system. Like it's cumulative. It's not like, you know, vitamin C you can flush out in 24 hours, right? Vitamin D actually sits in, in your body for a long time. Uh, went back three months later and tested my vitamin D level to come back down. Uh, started just eating mushrooms and not taking any vitamin D supplement anymore. And now I have a very healthy uh, level of vitamin D right through the winter. Um, so I no longer need that, that vitamin D supplement because of my, my mushroom consumption, which is kind of cool. Yeah, that's really fascinating to me because while I don't live as far north as you do, I think you're up in Ontario, mm -hmm. um, you know, here in North Idaho, we get long, dark winters also. So I definitely am in that needing to supplement with the vitamin D category. And I get my work, my blood work done also regularly to check that. And I'm like, it takes a lot of supplementation for me to get up to healthy levels on vitamin D during the midwinter time. And that's and not cheap so, either, right? There, there's another way you're saving money on the homestead. Yeah, exactly. Well, and you know, you know, it's got to be more bioavailable than Absolutely. anything you're taking out of a, a capsule. So I love that. That's really cool. Okay, so I kind of sidetracked you a little bit. You were working on outdoor mushrooms and growing them. And so let's move on from there. If, uh, if you were looking at indoor mushrooms, is that where you would go next? Yeah, I mean, we could either talk a little bit about the process of growing outdoors and some sure. tips, or we could get into indoor mushrooms. Where would you like to go next? No, let's hang with the outdoor mushrooms then and talk about some of the processes. Awesome, yeah. Well, like growing like things like wine caps in garden beds, like you said, that that's relatively straightforward because they're they're a very aggressive mycelium. Um, you know, so uh, basically mo all mushrooms um, need moisture. That's probably your most important thing. Whether you're growing indoors or outdoors, they need a high humidity. Um, so the, the substrate, substrate's the word we use for kind of like whatever we're going to grow our mushrooms in. Um, so generally you want them in a, in a place where that substrate is going to stay moist. 
Um, so that's an important thing to know. Now, wine cats, actually, the reason you can get away with them in garden beds and stuff, even though they dry out a little bit, they're such an aggressive mycelium and such an easy mushroom. They're one of the few that can actually tolerate a little bit of sunlight and tolerate drying out a little bit. Uh, most other mushrooms would not be able to grow in the, the garden path in your garden. Now, what we do with our wine cats is we'll often grow them under perennial crops or under our squash beds, uh, mm. particularly around our squash beds, because the squash grows so fast uh, and then their leaves are so big that they actually create that bit of shade uh, and increase the moisture in uh, the mulch underneath it that they're growing in. Uh, we also have a big patch of like elderberries and blueberries. Um, so we grow wine caps underneath our elderberries and blueberries again because they have that shade cover from above them, right? Um, but yeah, just, just know that. So moisture content is really, really important in the soil. Uh, mushrooms, uh, contrary to popular belief, they actually do need light. A lot of people, there's a misconception that mushrooms are growing in the dark. There's a handful of species that are, but most of them actually need light, but not direct sunlight, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's another important factor to just understand there and what mushrooms kind of need. So you can go in garden beds, you know, you're growing in straw or in wood chips. So basically you're going to take your straw, you want clean straw that's nice and dry. Um, you know, it's not, it doesn't have, you don't want a straw bale that, for example, that's been sitting out in a, a field for a month uh, and it's been getting rained on, right? So you're getting nice, clean straw, nice and dry, or you're getting nice, freshly dressed uh, chip wood chips and then you literally just go and buy a kit from the store you can break it up you can put some of the mycelium into the the, the straw there you know sometimes i'll throw down even a couple little pieces of cardboard in there um because it'll start to colonize that cardboard a little faster just you can get away with it without it but the cardboard helps kind of give it a kickstart. so that that one's fairly straightforward um beyond that we get into growing in logs and stuff like that and again it's you know it's, it's not rocket science but there are definitely little tricks to increasing it but the essence of it is is i need green wood first of all uh, so healthy trees. So if you, this is probably the number one question I get for log growing. People are like, oh, a tree came down in my backyard. Can I inoculate it with mushrooms? Mm -hmm. And if the tree came down in your backyard, there's a good chance it came down because there's already a fungus in it that's broken down the quality of the wood and allowed it to break in the first place. Now, if you get a really good windstorm and it actually breaks off a healthy branch, absolutely, you can probably inoculate it. But if it fell down for any other reason, you know, if it's got woodpecker holes in it, if it's got insect holes in it, if it came down naturally, you probably, it's already got other competing mycelium in it, unless it's not going to work. So usually we're, we're thinning healthy branches. Now, if you don't have access to a forest where you can harvest, get to know the local arborist, right? Or, or even just drive around the neighborhood, you know, even for somebody that lives in the city, uh, you know, drive around and look for where the arborists are taking down those big trees. Because usually those canopies are just getting dragged off to get chipped. And sometimes those logs in the canopy are actually the perfect size, you know, three inches, four inches, five inches. Uh, canopy logs are great size for inoculating mushrooms into them, right? Um, so you basically get your medium, which is going to be your log. Um, and then you're going to buy your spawn, which is usually sawdust that's been inoculated with the mycelium of choice. And I, I recommend shiitake for getting started. Um, mm -hmm. And then you're going to drill holes in it. And then you basically plug the spawn into the holes. You seal it up with wax. Uh, and then you're going to let them sit and... Um, uh, the mycelium basically will eat away at the wood. So shiitake logs, one thing that's interesting, it can take anywhere from eight to 24 months before mm. you get your first flush of mushrooms on. Uh, it's kind of like more like planting, you know, like a blueberry bush or something where you're not going to get any fruit the first couple of years. Uh, but then once it starts producing, it's incredibly prolific, right? Um, yeah, well, and if you're going to get fruit for up to like nine years and plus, then it's worth the wait, isn't it? Worth the wait there, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so that's kind of the essence of growing outdoors. Um, and then, of course, you can grow all kinds of other species. Like I grow lion's mane outdoors, you know, which is one of the most um, well-researched mushrooms around brain health. There's actually a ton of research coming out on mushrooms, even for people that have uh, dementia or at a, are at risk of dementia. Um, you know, lion's mane being a really great supplement for them to be taking. Uh, it's also really delicious and tasty as well, just on its own. Um, so we do eat it, but we often tincture ours um, into kind of a, a brain medicine. Uh, mataki mushroom, another incredibly medicinal one, you know, all kinds of good compounds. So those are, you know, there's a bunch of mushrooms we can do outdoors, but I suggest starting with shiitake because it's one of the easier ones. There's definitely some tricks of the trade to having success with things like mataki, lion's mane, and shiitake as well. You know, there, there is a little bit more to it than just what I explained on this podcast, but that, that gives your listeners kind of the, the based overview of how the process works. Yeah, let's talk about the type of trees because here I am in the West and so I am completely surrounded by pine trees, evergreen trees. Mm. Um, so what kind of logs are we looking for? Yeah, most of our mushrooms we are growing on deciduous trees or okay. hardwood trees. Um, there's a handful. So for example, our native reishi mushroom here on the East Coast, uh, Ganoderma tasuke, it's called. It's actually a hemlock reishi mm -hmm. uh, and it grows exclusively actually on hemlock, which is an evergreen tree. 
Um, so there are a handful of species that will grow on evergreen trees, but usually we're actually looking at hardwoods, you know, particularly shiitake, lion's mane, mataki, a lot of the more common ones. Um, so, you know, things like oak, things like maple, even like fruit trees, nut trees, um, okay. really most of your hardwoods, poplars, you know, you can grow on them. Uh, poplars have a softer wood. Yeah. So I find that uh, they don't last as long. So, you know, there, there'd be an example, you know, doing shiitake into poplars, that might be a species where you're more likely to get a fruit in eight to 12 months instead of 12 to 24, but you might only get four years out of the log. Whereas if you inoculate it in an oak log, you know, it might take you 24 months to fruit, but then that's where you're getting the nine years of the fruit off of it, right? Just yeah. because of the density of the wood. Yeah, that would make a lot of sense. So I would imagine that like cottonwood would probably fall under that same category. As yeah, like with the poplars. Yeah, 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 great, good. Well, that means that we have some options around here because we definitely yeah. have cottonwoods around. Yeah, you could definitely do, you could do oysters into cottonwood. You could also do shiitakes into cottonwood for sure. Oh, great. Okay, cool. And then the oysters, how do you, you didn't mention them with the logs. So do you do those the same way with the log? Uh, you you can do them with the logs. Um, I find, so again, because the oyster is such an aggressive growing mycelium, I find that it actually consumes the host fairly quick and you don't get as many years of flushing that you do with things like the shiitakes. So I found it's not as worth it for me to actually inoculate oyster logs um, for the amount of work to actually do it and how many years they produce. I, I just haven't found it to be as good of an exchange of energy. Um, I mean, I think it's still worthwhile, but um, we, we just chose not to do that. So I do a technique called log towers. Um, where um, you don't get as many years fluting off of it, but it's, uh, it's way, way quicker, where I literally just cut log rounds, and then I just lay mycelium in between those rounds. And sometimes, you know, I've got, I've got them flushing four months after I've done that. Um, oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, and then I do grow, oysters are actually my favorite mushroom to grow indoors, and I do them year round, um, and mostly growing on straw, so a nice clean straw source. Uh, oh, and even the coffee grounds that I mentioned to you earlier. So yeah. Okay. So that sounds really easy. Sounds like there's some good options. So let's use that as a transition. Let's go inside and talk about the good mushrooms that we can grow inside and the different techniques for doing that. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so again, for, for indoor growing, I think the first thing we do need to talk safety if we're going to grow indoors, right? Okay. Um, and when we're talking about safety, we're talking about both our own safety, our health and the health of our home. Um, cause mushrooms, when they release spores, which is how they reproduce, they don't reproduce by seeds. They reproduce by spores. They let out a lot of spores. You know, like, I don't know what the actual number is, but it's got to be like hundreds of thousands, if not billions, you know, like crazy amounts of spore. Like when they release, you know, there's a white film over everything around them, right? Um, and breathing in quantities of spores is not good for us. Um, and especially over time. So, you know, people, they're really trendy right now, these grow your own mushroom kits at home, yes. uh, where you buy like a little mushroom block and you get it home. And those are really great starting points. They're fun to learn. They're a cool project with kids you're probably gonna get close to as many mushrooms as what you paid for it. You know, you're gonna pay, pay $30 for your mushroom block and you might get $30 of mushrooms out of your mushroom block. So you're not necessarily uh, increasing your self-reliance growing on those blocks, but it is a great way to learn. Um, why I'm saying this for safety though, you know, most of those kits, they don't come with any warning. They just say, yeah, throw it in your kitchen sink or in your bathroom or whatever, let it grow. Uh, and the general thought is that, you know, there's so few spores coming off of that one block that it's not going to be a health problem. That's just generally what's kind of thought. Um, if you're growing any more than that, you absolutely want to think about ventilation for it or capturing those spores. So I grow in something called a monotub. So they're basically clear plastic tubs. And this is actually great because it increases your success significantly. Uh, and it sounds fancy, but it's relatively simple as well. I make a tub. Um, which actually allows me now to keep an environment where the humidity is high anyways, right? Because right? if yeah. you're just growing on your counter, chances are your house, especially in the wintertime, is too dry anyways, and your mushrooms are going to start to grow, and then they're just going to dry up. You put it inside of a chamber, you're able to actually control the humidity in there uh, and keep it kind of up around like 80 90%, which you're actually going to get way better flushes to begin with. But the great part now is when the spores release, they're doing it inside of your tub. Um, and it's not spreading through your home. You're not breathing them in. And then of course there's the risk of the home as well too. You know, it's probably low risk that spores are actually going to float through your home and inoculate something in your home. <laughs> like I, I'd say very low risk, but interesting enough, I had, um, I was growing mushrooms in these old garden tubs, like garden pots in my basement. Um, and I had a block that I thought was kind of finished and I just stuck it down in my root cellar. And I kind of forgot about it for a couple of months. And I went back and the mycelium had literally grown across the floor and into the wood uh, frame of my door. Oh. Yeah, which that's that's not good. You don't no. you don't actually want that to happen, right? 
Um, fortunately, my house is dry enough that it already kind of died by the time I found it. But if you lived in a very moist home, you know, theoretically, you could end up with oyster mushrooms growing out of your wall. Uh, and now, uh -huh. and, you know, if your home is kind of susceptible to mold and bacteria in the first place, or not bacteria, but if your home is susceptible to mold, mm -hmm. it's definitely susceptible to mycelium potentially getting into, you know, some of your boards and stuff like that. So just, just something to think about, you know, probably low risk, but not impossible. And there's my story about growing in the root cellar. There so you I, go. So keep I your like to bring a chamber well. to grow inside yeah. of. And if you want to grow more than what you can grow in a couple of chambers, then you can actually kind of like it, and if you have a wood shop and you create a little fan that goes to the outside, you can actually create ventilation to now take those spores outside mm -hmm. through a window as well. But that's getting a little more advanced. Yeah. So when you're talking about a chamber, I mean, it sounds to me like you're actually talking about like a storage container that's clear almost. Yeah. Isn't that simple? Yeah, like, like a rubber made, you know, fairly yeah. straightforward. And what's cool, like in a small amount of space, you can literally stack like six of those on top of each other. And in a two by two space going up the side of your wall, you've almost got a constant supply of mushrooms, right? Wow. That's pretty cool. Yeah. That's actually really neat. It, it, yeah, you can cycle them. So, you know, the one on the bottom, it's kind of inoculating right now. And the one on the middle is about to fruit. And the one on the top is the one that's actually fruiting. And you actually cycle them. So they're they're constantly coming. Like you can do that in an urban apartment um, if you wanted to. And then you're actually able to look. And if there's any sign that spore is actually released, you could actually just take it outside and open it up outside to actually harvest it or tend it. So you're not letting out that large quantity of spore into your house, right? Yeah. Yeah, that is pretty neat. So let's talk about the light requirements. Like I know you said they're not grown in the dark, but they don't like direct light. So do we yeah. need grow lights or is just ambient no, lighting? No, indirect light, you know? So if you're in a, if you have them in a room with a window in mm -hmm. it and you just have them off to the side so that the sun's not hitting right on them, you know, just that ambient light of the room is generally, uh, generally all you need for it. If it's a darker space, then, you know, some people will set up grow lights. I've, I've seen more advanced kind of mono chambers and sure. mono tubs and fruiting chambers that have lights in them. But I don't. So I, I basically have them in my laundry room in these clear tubs and they're just sitting on a shelf in the corner, um, you know, just indirect light in that room there. Well, that's easier than growing just about anything else you can grow inside, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, it, it actually is, you know? things. Yeah. And again, there's a little bit of work to that initial inoculation step. But once you kind of get your systems dialed for it, uh, it's actually it's actually pretty quick to, to get them cycling and keep that constant supply going. Yeah, that's really neat. So let's talk about the medium that you're growing in when you're in those chambers. Is that you've you've mentioned straw, you've mentioned coffee grounds. Um, what's your favorite for that sort of scenario? Yeah, well, I, I mostly grow oysters indoors. So okay. straw works great and coffee grounds work because they're, well, coffee grounds are just a waste product I have. Right. Straw is relatively cheap and very accessible. Um, you know, one thing I would encourage people to just think about is where they're getting their straw from. Um, yes. And there is, you know, there's definitely some controversy around that. You know, some mushroom growers just grow on whatever straw and they're not worried about it. Um, and I, I've actually just grown on straw. I've grown on straw many times where I had no idea where it came from. But we know, you know, straw is sprayed, you know, using things like Roundup on straw is, is common. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, everything I've read suggests that things have broken down so much by the time that you're getting it that it's not a worry. But mushrooms are accumulators of, you know, mushrooms are used in, you know, bioremediation projects where they're literally using mushrooms to pull toxins out of soil. You know, mushrooms can accumulate lead and, um, and different things like that. So, you know, I do suggest trying to get a clean straw source if that's an option. Um, so whether you can get organic straw or if you just know a farmer uh, and you know what they're putting on their fields, uh, that, that's kind of helpful. Um, there's all kinds of other mediums you can grow on, you know, things like coconut husks. Uh, really, there's all kinds of different carbon sources that you grow on. Um, you can get compressed uh, wood chips. You know, when you get into the realms of growing things like lion's mane and mataki and reishi, like some of those more medicinal mushrooms, um, usually they're not growing on straw at that point. They're actually growing on wood chips and you can actually, uh, or sorry, compress like uh, sawdust fiber. So you literally can buy bags of it through like mushroom grow stores and they're these little pellets. And when you mix them with the water, they actually expand um, and then you inoculate them. Often you're adding a little bit of uh, food in there as well. So like, you know, things like uh, wheat germ or things like that. Uh, to feed them it gets a little bit uh when you get into the realm of like reishi mataki lion's mane it, it definitely gets a lot more complex than this basic oyster on straw or oyster on coffee that i i chat about and again because oysters are so aggressive you can get away with this really simple system that you can just do in your kitchen and likely have a fair bit of success with um when you get into the more medicinal projects that are a bit harder uh, absolutely doable, but there's a little bit more to it. You know, you're suddenly you're talking about using your pressure canner and bringing it up to certain temperature for your wood chips. And then you're inoculating it with the spore literally through a syringe and the, the screen. And it, it gets a little more fancy at that point, you know? 
Yeah, definitely. <laughs> you know, all of these things, you can get really technical. Um, yeah, yeah, which is you why just people start tomatoes. with oysters. Yeah, well, I mean, with your tomatoes, like you can dial in tomato growing oh, yeah. to a crazy science and you can spend thousands of dollars on producing the best tomatoes, you know. So it's always fun to see things that we have the really simple version and the really easy thing to do. So I love the idea of being able to reuse something that we already have on the homestead, like the coffee grounds, if you're drinking coffee. And again, that's probably another one has a, a propensity to have a lot of toxins in it and actually a lot of funguses and molds in it if you're not getting really good quality coffee to begin with which you should be if you're drinking it and putting it into your body all the time. Um, so start with a good medium, but you know, you're talking about straw. What if you don't have straw on the homestead, but you do have, you know, really good quality hay for animals or maybe even grass clippings from your lawn that hasn't been sprayed. Do you have flexibility to bring that type of stuff in? Does it need to be carbonaceous and so just dry and then it's okay? Or are there more requirements? Yeah, I haven't played around with grass or hay, but theoretically it makes sense to me that it would work. Okay. Um, you know, I'm sure if you did a quick little internet search, I can't really speak to it because I haven't done it. Um, sure. So I'm sure you could do a quick internet search, but you know, uh, I, I'm, I would be surprised if it wouldn't work. Okay. Um, the thing you're going to want, you're going to want to make sure it's dry. Uh, it's clean. You know, you wouldn't want to be... Um, uh, you know, raking up grass that had sat there and been rained on multiple times, right? right? So you'd want to get it fresh, you'd want to dry it out, uh, you'd want to know that it's nice and clean. And then you probably would want to go through a uh, pasteurization process for it. You know, okay. when you kind of bring it up to I forget the exact number, but I want to say it's like around 165 degrees Fahrenheit or something like that, whatever the pasteurization temperature is. Uh, there's chemical ways you can you can pasteurize as well, you know, with like peroxide or with uh, with lime. Uh, so there's there's different ways you could do that. But I, I would probably want to pasteurize it. Um, you know, I, I get away with my straw. You can you can pasteurize. A lot of people pasteurize straw as well. Although I've gotten away with just using it literally straight from the braille. Again, because oysters are so aggressive. Uh, same with your coffee. You know, you may uh, and if you're having trouble with mold, you know, you may want to pasteurize your coffee first. But I've had success. Just literally, I take the coffee, I throw it into the freezer bag, wait till I have enough to fill a mason jar, take it out, put it in there, layer my mycelium in, and let it do its thing. You know, and I, I've had success that way as well. So. And of course, the reason behind the pasteurization idea is that we don't want a lot of competing molds or other Absolutely. funguses in order, you know, we want to make sure that we're inoculating and growing what we're trying to grow Absolutely. and that something else isn't killing it off. Yeah. So yeah, that, that kind of starts to open up a lot of things if you can look around and start going, hey, maybe, you know, maybe those grass clippings would work if you've got them nice and clean and they haven't gotten moldy sitting around and have the opportunity for things to um, to grow in them. But that is really fascinating. Are there any other mushrooms that kind of fall outside of the, um, the, the methods that you've talked about here that are your favorite to grow or things that you really like growing? Um, yeah, no, th those are kind of the main ones. I mean, I'm really excited about lion's mane these days. Um, yeah. You know, we've been doing a lot of research and, and again, in Laura's family, um, there's a, uh, a few, People in her family have had dementia issues, you know, and with some of the um, some of the aunts and uncles starting to age, we've been really thinking about, you know, lion's mane tincture as, as being a really good medicine just to be supportive of them. And, and even for our own brains, you know, as we age. Um, so so lion's mane is one I'm pretty excited about. Um, I do grow it outside already, but I'm just starting to, to play around with growing it indoors, um, which is kind of getting into this more uh, extensive setup where we're literally using an autoclave and we're sterilizing and we're not pasteurizing at this place. We're fully sterilizing, you know, under okay. pressure. Um, yeah, so that takes it a whole nother step forward, but that's really neat. Yeah, and then of course foraging, you know, opens up a whole nother world. There's all kinds of mushrooms that we we forage uh, and dry and preserve, you know, in that medicinal realm and use year round, you know. Um, we love doing, uh, one of our favorites in the winter is a mushroom chai uh, with a mm. lot of the tree mushrooms. So we do a chai, you know, with your typical like cinnamon and cardamom and all your chai spices. Um, but then we'll actually steep things like turkey tail and birch polypore and foamies fomenteris and uh, reishi mushroom, you know. Um, so we'll have basically all these kind of tree polypore mushrooms that are all just chock full of all kinds of great stuff. Uh, and we'll we'll steep those for multiple days with the chai spices uh, and just have that either going in the crock pot or, or sometimes it's just sitting on the wood stove, you know, and just you come in there and pour it out, and put a little honey in there. And wow, what a great drink it is. Oh, that sounds amazing. And it sounds like it would be absolutely amazing for your immune health, too. Absolutely. During well, especially in the, and we don't tend to do it in the summer, but in the wintertime when we're, you know, during cold and flu season seems to be when we we tend to do that, you know? Yeah, that is really neat. So really quickly, what do you think the number one mistake that you see beginners making when it comes to growing mushrooms that you would warn people off of? Um, 
probably just really understanding the growing needs at the different stages is really, really important. You know, when you first inoculate them, their needs are a little bit different than when they're ready to fruit. Yeah. Um, so that would probably be like the base one, just kind of understand what they need while they're growing and understand what they need to fruit. And then beyond that, you know, so if you're growing indoors, probably the two biggest ones are not enough. So if people are growing in tubs, not enough oxygen okay. is a big issue. And then you get really long spindly mushrooms. So okay. that could be a problem or just not being meticulous enough and keeping everything clean. And then all of a sudden you've got mold growing on your mushrooms, right? So those, those are probably the basics for there. Um, outdoor growing, um, probably actually one is just not waiting long enough when people are doing shiitakes. You know, people will go and do their shiitake logs. Actually, I'll, I'll share two for shiitakes. Keep them moist. Okay. Um, so the very first year I, I keep the logs close to my house. And if it doesn't rain once a week, I'll actually water them, like throw the sprinkler on them. Sure. Once they've, uh, we call it being colonized. So once the log is fully full of mycelium, they're actually incredibly hardy. Oh. So the first year I baby them a little bit, you know, and I will actually keep them close to the house. I'll throw a sprinkler on them. So they're in the shade full. They can be full shade at this point, uh, because the mycelium is just growing inside of the log. Uh, make sure that they get watered once or twice a week until you basically see the mycelium growing on the end of the logs. Once you see the mycelium on the end of the logs, then you I just toss them into the forest and now they're just good. I don't do anything. I don't water them. I basically, all I do is harvest after them. So keeping the moisture in that first year is huge for outdoors. And then two, uh, people will often let the logs sit for a year or two and they're like, oh, it didn't work and they forget about it. And then three, four years later, they walk past and they're like, oh my goodness, there's mushrooms growing out of that, you know? <laughs> We've actually given up on logs when we first started in the early days and we'd go and build them into our garden and use them like it's like terraces and stuff. And then we'd come back and like a year later, they'd be fruiting and we thought they were no good and we just didn't wait long enough. So, so patience is a virtue as well. Well, I am really encouraged by this because it, while I, while I understand there's details, there's ways, you know, you want to do it the right way. It's actually way more simple in the process than I had been under the impression of. So that's really exciting and um, something that I'm really looking forward to getting into. So you guys, I want to tell you, if you are interested in this also, Chris has been incredibly generous and offered you guys as listeners a 25% off coupon for his um, Growing and Foraging Wild Mushrooms course, which is amazing. And I am so excited. I have uh, one of his courses. I haven't gotten into it yet, but I'm really excited that Josh and I are going to sit down with all the kids and we are going to watch it. We're going to be taking it and learning a lot about growing our own mushrooms specifically. But we have a lot to forage up here too that we need to learn too. We are in a very damp environment, forested environment. So we have tons of mushrooms all around us. And we've only learned how to find and identify a couple of the top ones. So if you're interested in this topic, maybe make sure you go um, grab the link that's associated with this podcast show notes. Um, so we'll put it in the description and make sure you use the coupon code that we'll have down there for you too, for 25% off. And if you just want to know a little bit more about Chris or check out what he's doing, visit him at www.chrisoutdoors with an S dot C A. Um, for Canada there. So this has just been amazing and really encouraging. Chris, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, you're welcome. That was a blast. Fun to, fun to chat with you there. All right. Thank you. We'll see you guys real soon. Goodbye.